Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays Before the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren. I am your host. And today we will be jumping into uh, what will be part one, uh, <clears throat> part one of a at least two part uh, lecture bit here that we'll be doing on the Wars of Justinian. So we've started, you know, we're, we're doing our, our piece of Byzantine history, which of course covers the great uh, Emperor Justinian and his great general Belisarius, sometimes called the last Roman. Um, apologize if my voice sounds a little different. If I'm sniffling more, I've had a little bit of a cold this week. Uh, one of the guys I lift with at my gym mentioned uh, the other day that he's been sick for like a week. And so now I know where I've gotten it from. So I blame him entirely. And if I die, It'll be his fault. Uh, no, joking. I'll be, I'll be fine. I'm being intentionally overdramatic. Uh, but so uh, I do apologize for that. Uh, we so today, yes, we will start off. We'll be doing the Bandelic War today, and then we'll be taking the Gothic War up until Belisarius's capture of Naples. And then our next lecture will begin with Belisarius entering Rome unopposed. Uh, thanks to Theodahad, who we'll talk about uh, later on. Uh, uh, Procopius takes uh, a lot of uh, gratuitous shots at Theodahad's uh, manhood, who we'll, who we'll get into here in a bit. But, <clears throat> oh, if you found this video on YouTube, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and then make sure you ring the notification bell so you never miss another episode. We are also available on Apple Podcast and Google Play, so give us a follow there. And especially if you're listening on iTunes, give us a five-star review. That really helps uh, the growth of the show. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Professor Wren, where I post updates about the show. So, a little, br a brief little background on Belisarius. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do a full like who was uh, Belisarius episode like I do, uh, you know, my my like like we did who was Procopius, uh, for example. <coughs> so, Belisarius was born in about 500 AD in Thrace or modern Bulgaria. His family was Latin speaking, so Latin was his first language. Although he almost certainly would have known Greek uh, because that. It's just how you function in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, he was a career military man, and he worked his way up the ranks to the imperial bodyguard of Justinian I. And he would later go on to craft his own elite heavy cavalry unit known as the Bucellari, or if you prefer the Greek pronunciation, the Bucellari. Uh, these were pretty, I, as I was reading about, it was, it was very cool because uh, when I have, you know, when, when I play Total War, as I'm sure many of us who are into history, who are about my age, you know, we've, we've played Total War at some point. And I always enjoyed uh, uh, very versatile units, uh, uh, like a, a cavalry unit that w could do heavy melee, but it could also uh, be a, a horse archer unit. I always, I always enjoyed using those units. And as I read about the Bucellari, it seems like they were that, uh, it, it said that they could they could be used as heavy shot cavalry. They fought with lances, but then they also carried bows and they could be used as uh, horse archers. And I thought, this, I, I like this. I like the sound of this. Uh, but it was Belisarius's time in, the, in various uh, uh, roles in the Imperial Guard, which is how he came to know Justinian. Of course, they were, they were good buddies and Belisarius uh, really proves himself to Justinian at the Nika riots where he takes his soldiers out and uses uh, his his military to put down uh, the Nika riots, which uh, essentially saved Justinian's rule as emperor. So Justinian's wars begin with the Vandalic War. Now the Vandals, as we've talked about, you can go back and watch our episode on uh, on the Vandals in our Barbarian Invasion little mini series. I guess we could call this the Justinian mini series. Uh, but the Vandals rule kingdom in North Africa and various other places in the Mediterranean, including like uh, Corsica, Sardinia, and the Balearic Islands. And they were previously ruled by the Romans up until about the 450s, 460s. Uh, Vandalic uh, kingdom, however, was barely holding on by a thread. 
uh, Geyserich, who, who founded the Vandela Kingdom, was the most competent, a barely a highly competent guy. Um, but all of his successors really never lived up to his, his greatness as a ruler. And so therefore, uh, by the time we get to uh, the, five, the 530s, when, when the Wars of Justinian begin, uh, the, Va the Vandals are just barely holding on. I mean, a lot of what they have going for them at this point is that North Africa is very easily defensible because it's surrounded by water. And if you wanted to march over from Egypt, it would take a very long time. and You'd have to walk through the desert and all these sorts of things. Now, uh, the Vandela Kingdom was ruled by a guy named Gelimer, who had deposed his cousin Hilderic. Now, Hilderic uh, seems to have been a direct descendant of Geyseric. Now, Gelimer probably also has some uh, link to Geyseric, but Hilderic was somewhat friendly to the Byzantines, and so when he is deposed, Justinian uses this as a pretext for an invasion of North Africa. Ostensibly, his goal was to uh, restore the rule of Hilderic, but whether or not that was actually going to happen is a different story. And Hilderic is actually killed before uh, the Byzantines take full control over North Africa anyway, so it's a bit of a moot point. Interestingly enough, uh, the idea of the invasion of North Africa in the first place was actually pretty widely opposed by many in the uh, many important people in the Byzantine Empire. For example, uh, many in the senatorial class <coughs> opposed the invasion because uh, they still remember the disastrous armada of 468 commanded by Basiliscus. Uh, that was when the Eastern Empire attempted to send uh, uh, a last ditch effort to uh, a massive armada of ships to North Africa to try to uh, uh, push back the vandals there in North Africa. It was a complete disaster, total failure, almost bankrupted the Eastern Roman Empire. And it was really at that point where many people in the East basically gave up on the idea of propping up the Western Empire. And to make a, to make a distinction about that, Justinian is not uh, taking back these areas of the old Western Empire to try to refound the Western Empire. He's just incorporating them into his empire, right? So he's not trying to restart an old entity that had not existed for a number of years. It's about, uh, it's about 60 years by this point. He's really just doing it to, to add on to the already existing empire. But interestingly enough, generals and soldiers also were not thrilled about the idea as well. They had just returned home from the Persian, from wars with the Persians, which we might talk about a little bit later this week. We might do a short midweek video on uh, the wars that were going on with the Persians right before this. Uh, but they had just come home and they hadn't had quite had a chance to enjoy the comforts of home before being shipped off to Oregon. You know, sit, see the wife and the kids sleep in a real bed, eat a decent hot meal and these sorts of things. However, very few people had the cojones to voice this opposition to Justinian, who was very strong-willed and did not take opposition or criticism very well. <clears throat> and so the invasion went on. Now, right off the back, right off the bat, Gelimer is dealing with a rebellion from a certain guy named Goda, who is the governor of Sardinia. He's basically the, the guy who's in charge in Sardinia is breaking off from the Vandals and, uh, and seemingly he's trying to join up with Belisarius, whether or not he's really serious about that uh, might be questionable, but he is certainly breaking off from the Vandals. And so Gelmer has to send forces from North Africa up to deal with that, which is going to divert some of the resources that he has to, uh, to fight Belisarius when he arrives. So it's good timing for the Romans in, in this sense. I'll read a little bit. Again, I'm using here the, uh, the Hackett classic, uh, the War of Justinian by Procopius, translated by H.B. Dewing and revised and modernized 
by Anthony Caldellis. This is from page 68. There was a certain Goda among the slaves of Gelmer, a Goth by birth, and a passionate man and an energetic man who had who had great bodily strength and seemed to be loyal to the interest of his master. To this Goda, Gelmer entrusted the island of Sardinia in order to both guard the island and to pay over the annual tribute. But he could not digest the prosperity brought to him by fortune, nor had he the heart to endure it. And so he undertook to establish a tyranny, refusing to continue the payments of tribute and actually detaching the island from the Vandals and holding it for himself. When he perceived that the Emperor Justinian was about to make war against the Libyans, Gelmer wrote this to him as follows, and it, it is essentially saying uh, that he's, he's breaking off with him and joining up with Justinian. So, so that is that is a factor in in what's happening here uh, with the. Hold on here. Prop the book open with my phone. But that's a factor in in what's going to happen here with the invasion of North Africa by Belisarius. <clears throat> now, the expedition first set sail to Syracuse, and they kind of. Uh, dock in Syracuse and resupply for a bit before they reach the shores of North Africa. And when they do first arrive, there's actually a debate because they, they land uh, some distance away from Carthage, which is obviously the main target of the campaign. And there's this debate about whether or not they should uh, continue on land to get to Carthage or whether they should stay on the boats and sail to Carthage. Now, Belisarius ultimately decides to disembark uh, where, where they've basically reached land and to march on foot up to Carthage. Uh, he seems to be afraid or concerned that if they get caught out at sea, the Vandal fleet may, uh, may you know, defeat them and uh, really ruin the whole campaign, which thinking back to the disastrous armada of 468 is a reasonable concern because that's, that's essentially what happened last time. And he also says marching up on foot along the coast will allow for an element of surprise. Read a little bit of that here uh, from the book. This is on page 177. Belisarius says, if we do sail straight for Carthage and a hostile fleet encounters us, the soldiers would be blameless if they were to flee with all their might for a delinquency announced beforehand carries within its own defense. But for us, even if we come through safely, there will be no forgiveness. Skipping ahead a little bit here. Apart from this, at the present time, we will fall upon the enemy unprepared. And in all probability, we will fare as we desire for military affairs are mastered by the element of surprise. So you see there, Belisari is making that case about maintaining the element of surprise and also attacking the enemy while they are not prepared which uh, certainly is the case, as we'll see. Now, the first major engagement, there's two major engagements in the Vandalic Wars. It's pretty short. Uh, uh, they actually, the, the, the Romans managed to uh, wrap it up in about nine months, so it doesn't even take them a year to, to uh, retake the Vandalic Kingdom. But the first one comes at the Battle of Adichimum. Uh, this battle was resolved fairly quickly as a victory for the Romans when uh, the Vandalic general Amada's force was routed. And then uh, as, as they're retreating, uh, they run into more Vandal forces which are coming out from Carthage. Amada, uh, some of his forces got ahead of the other uh, units in his army and the initial group gets routed by the Romans and then that group retreats back into the soldiers which are coming out of Carthage and it creates a big uh, chaos and even, even more routing ensues after that. We'll take a look at what Procopius has to say about it here on page 181. <clears throat> 
As it was, Amada came early to Dichimum about midday while both we, uh, Procopius talking about the Romans, and the Vandal army were far away. And he went, uh, he went wrong in that he did not arrive at the right time and also leaving at Carthage the army of the Vandals, commanding them to come to Dichimum as quickly as possible while he, with a few men, uh, joined with battle with Ioannis's men. Now, uh, I should make here uh, a, a note here. When, it's, uh, when he refers to uh, Ioannis, that is the Greek form of John, and he's usually referring to John the Armenian, uh, who was a pretty well known, probably the best known and most competent uh, general who served under Belisarius. Uh, so when I, I just want to make that point that when I reference you on uh, the, the, in the notes about names at the start in the introduction of the book, the translator, Candelis, uh, uh, right? Caldelis, excuse me, uh, says that he's mostly using uh, Greek names in this, in this translation, which is appropriate. I mean, Procopius is writing this in Greek. It's about a lot of you know, Greek speaking people understand, understand that why that option was used. Anyway, uh, he killed 12 of the best men who were fighting in the front rank, but he himself fell, having shown himself a brave man in this engagement. He's talking about Amada here. After Amada's fall, the route became complete and the vandals, fleeing at top speed, went back all the, uh, uh, sorry, swept back all those who were coming from Carthage to Dichimum for they were not advancing in order and drawn up as for battles, but in companies and small ones at that, right? They're, they're not marching out in battle formation, they're marching in marching formation, which uh, if, if you know anything about, I mean, and anything basic about military uh, uh, procedures, mar uh, the, the way you're marching is usually in a column, whereas uh, you're not drawn up in the, in the battle lines uh, as you're marching to the battlefield. Seeing the vandals under Amada fleeing and thinking that their pursuers were a great multitude, they turned and joined in the flight. Ioannis and his men, killing all whom they met, advanced as far as the gates of Carthage. And there was so great a slaughter of the vandals in those 70 stades a state is, I, I looked this up, it's like an eighth of a mile. I, I don't know exactly why they're using this measurement, but that's what it is. Uh, that those who beheld it would have supposed that it was the work of an enemy 20,000 strong. So that's, the, that's our first uh, major engagement. Now, uh, and after this, the Romans uh, take Carthage really without too much issue. Uh, they get in there, but uh, before they can get in, again, as I mentioned earlier, Gemmler is going to uh, kill Hilderic, who, right, that, that was ostensibly the reason why the Romans were conducting this campaign. But, oh, look, now that the guy who we were going to restore into power is dead, I guess we're just going to have to take this place for ourselves. Oh, to, to twist my arm around enough, I guess we can do it, right? Obviously, uh, uh, that, that, I mean, that was the point of the campaign from the, from the very beginning. Uh, you just had, Justinian, I think, with, with, a, with a mind for legalities, right, because he, do, he does his legal codex, codex wants to have a, a good legal uh, uh, reasoning behind the things that he's doing, which is, which is not terrible. You know, you need, to have, you need to have a reasonable explanation for everything that you're doing. Uh, but so the next, the next uh, uh, major engagement in the Vendela campaign comes, so this is after the Romans have taken Carthage, Gemmler leads uh, the remainders of the Vandals in an attempt to retake his old capital. And we're gonna have a battle at Tricar, Tricamarum, excuse me, Tricamarum, uh, and the Byzantines uh, are going to meet the Vandals there a second time, and he will read a little bit about that as well. We're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of readings out of the book in, in this episode, in this lecture here today. Uh, a, lot, a lot of it is battle descriptions.
Okay. Okay. <clears throat> After both Gemmler and uh, Sazo, Sazo is another uh, Vandalic general. He was sent to Sardinia to try to put down the rebellion there, and now he's returned to North Africa, and so he's going to attempt to help out the Vandals in fighting the Romans. Uh, they had spoken such exhortations. Uh, this is right before this. He he gives a, a little speech that uh, uh, Sazo gives to his men before the battle. Uh, they led out of they led out the Vandals, and at about the time of lunch, when the Romans were not expecting them, but were preparing their meal, they were at hand and arrayed for battle along the banks of the river. Now the river at the place is ever flowing, to be sure, but its current is so small that it does not, sorry, that it is not even given a special name by the locals, being designated simply as a brook. So the Romans came to the other bank of this river after preparing as well as they could uh, under the circumstances and arrayed themselves as followed. And then it gives a, you know, which, which commander is on which flank and uh, who's, who's commanding what uh, forces and all of this. After a considerable time had passed and no one began the battle, Ioannis chose a few of those under him by the advice of Belisarius and crossing the river made an attack on the center where Sazo pushed them back and gave chase. The Romans in, f in flight returned to their army while the Vandals in pursuit came as far as the stream, but they did not cross the stream. Once more, Ioannis leading out more of the guardsmen of Belisarius made a dash against the forces of Sazo and again, being repulsed from there, withdrew to the Roman line. And a third time, with almost all the guardsmen and spearmen of Belisarius, he took the general standard and made his attack with much shouting and great noise. The barbarians manfully withstood them and used only their swords, so the battle became fierce and many of the noblest vandals fell. Among them, Zazo himself, the brother of Gimler, the brother of Gimel. Then at last, the whole Roman army was set into motion, crossed the river and advanced upon the enemy. And the route beginning in the center became complete for each unit easily routed those before them. The Masegete, and I should, I'll pause here to just make a note about the Masegete. Uh, Procopius uses the, t the words uh, Huns and Masegete interchangeably. Now the Masegete or the Masegetai uh, if you played Rome to Total War, they were a, a step faction. They were a, a, a cavalry-based uh, Eurasian step faction. So it's understandable, I guess, why Procopius would use the, the term Masegetai and Huns interchangeably, but he's talking for, for the best way for us to understand it is he's talking about Huns. So these are Huns who are auxiliaries in the Roman army uh, fighting as, as cavalrymen. But anyway, the Masegetai, seeing this, according to the agreement among themselves, joined the Roman army in making the pursuit, but this pursuit did not last long. Uh, it, it's, a, it's very interesting. The, the Masegetai, uh, Procopius says, I, I, I did not read this part to you guys, uh, but essentially what they do is they, they kind of wait at a, at a distance from the army and they kind of wait to see like who they think is going to win. And then whoever they think is going to win, that's the side who they choose to fight with. It's very... I don't like it. It's, it's, that's, that's very just not, uh, it's sleazy. It's, 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 it's a sleazy way to go about it, but I guess that's what happens when you, when you rely on mercenaries too much. Uh, but anyway, so, so the Vandals are going to retreat and that is going to be the end uh, of the conflicts here in the Vandalic War. Now, one thing to remember in terms of the occupation of these lands, I want to bring this up, but I'll, I'll probably re-emphasize this point a couple of times, is that <clears throat> most of the people living in the territory that Belisarius is taking are Romans themselves, right? Although they are now ruled by Germanic 
barbarian uh, masters. That it, the a number of guys who are in that ruling Germanic class is much smaller than the native Roman, probably still Latin speaking population. Okay. It, since four, since the four seventies and the four sixties, right up until now, which is about the five thirties, it's only about a 60, 70 year separation between Roman rule and that point in time. So you're talking there, there's Pete, there's going to be people around who maybe still remember growing up under Roman rule as a kid. Certainly lots of people who remember hearing about it from their parents and grandparents. And a lot of them, you know, still thinking, maybe even thinking of themselves as Roman, uh, probably speaking Latin at home, although I, I'm sure that you've got a lot of people who are learning Gothic just because it's the, it's the language that pe people are using for administrative and probably business and various other things. Uh, but a lot of these people are going to welcome Belisarius and the Romans back because they're like, hey, we're, we're Romans. Like, we, we, we want to live under Roman rule. Uh, that, that sounds fine to us. We, you know, these Vandal or Gothic or whoever guys, we don't, we don't like them that much. We, we want the Romans back. Uh, there is going to be a little bit of distance. We'll, we'll talk about this more during the Italian campaign, but there, there is a bit of a distrust in the Italian nobility. Uh, that like, sure, okay, they basically say, sure, you Romans, you're going to show up now, but how long are you guys really going to stick around here? Because we've heard, we've, you know, we've heard this song before, and they're, they're kind of afraid that second verse is the same as the first. Um, but for the time, for the time being here, most, and, and Procopius is saying this, uh, is that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the native peoples in these areas are, are very happy to see Belisarius coming. A lot of cities are just going to, you know, surrender without a fight because they're like, hey, we, we want to be back under the rule of the Roman Empire. And then uh, after the, after the main threat is dealt with in North Africa, Belisarius is going to send out uh, various generals uh, to recover uh, the, the, the kind of more fringe parts of the Vendel Kingdom. But so I'll, I'll read a couple of these here. This is on page 202 uh, of my translation. This is in book, uh, book four, chapter five, verse, uh, starting in verse one. Uh, for, the, for those of you who maybe have not dealt with uh, uh, ancient sources, uh, the, typically the way uh, you would cite them is book, chapter, and verse. So the same way you would cite the Bible because you know, these books are not, th these things are written before there's page numbers uh, and different translations are going to have to, you know, my, on my translation, this might be page 201. Uh, sorry if I, I think I said page 202, it's 201. Uh, but in your translation it might be on page 205. So this, the best way to do that, to really to uh, uh, cite where you are in the book is to give a book chapter over. So actually I'll make a mental note of that and I'll, I'll try to start doing that. It's more accurate to tell you where, I, where I'm reading from exactly. But so he, he's talking about Belisarius, sent out an army to recover for the Romans everything the Vandals had ruled. First, he sent Chirilios to Sardinia uh, with a great force at the head and the head of Sarzo, so that uh, Sarzo guy who was the brother of Gimler, uh, they, be, they behead him and uh, Chirilios uh, uh, goes out, <laughs> leads his army with the head of Sazo on a pike. That's pretty, that's pretty based, not gonna lie. Uh, he then uh, ordered Chirilios to send part of the army to Corsica and recover that island. So they're taking back Corsica and Sardinia. Uh, to Caesarea and Maritanios, or sorry, in Mauritania, Belisario sent Ioannis with an infantry unit that he usually commanded himself. Uh, and so uh, Maritan, that's uh, more uh, west, further west in North Africa than uh, Carthage. A different Ioannis, uh, one of his own guardsmen, he sent to the Straits of Cadiz uh, by one of the pillars of Hercules to take possession of the fort there that they called Septum. Uh, so this is, this is uh, today we would call it the Straits of Gibraltar, but he's sending guys out. Uh, uh, back then they called it the Pillars of Hercules. And um, the, the, they're recovering the, the North African coastline, essentially, as well as the, uh, as the islands throughout the Mediterranean that the, uh, that the Vandals controlled, which the Romans had previously controlled. 
And that really brings an end to the Vandalic War. Like I said, it gets wrapped up in nine months. It's very quick and we're done. Uh, <clears throat> the Romans do take part of Spain as well, but we're not going to talk a whole lot about it. Although I, I will point out, I do remember learning about this when, when, uh, when we took Byzantine history, was that uh, the Visigothic kingdom in, his, in, in Iberia actually was pretty weak. And had the Romans pushed a little harder, excuse me, uh, had they pushed a little harder into Iberia, they probably could have taken a lot more the, the, if you look on a, up on a map. And let me know, by the way, I, I know I haven't done PowerPoints in the last couple episodes, but uh, let me know in the comments if you guys miss the PowerPoints, if you liked it better when I had visual aids, uh, or if, uh, if you're kind of ambivalent to it. Um, it's easier for me to read the notes on the computer because I'm very, I can, I, I'm very forgetful. Uh, I'm very much like my father in this, you know, my mother will always say, you know, he can, about my dad, she's like, he can remember all this stuff that happened a thousand years ago. You know, he, he's a medieval history, medieval historian. He can remember all this stuff that happened a thousand years ago, but he can't remember that, uh, the, you know, the three things he had to get at the store or whatever. And I'm very much the same way. Like, oh, I remember all this stuff about Justinian and Belisarius, but I can't remember to print the notes when I'm at work. Because uh, I don't, I don't have a printer in my apartment. It's this little, it's this tiny little hole in the wall. Uh, I'd call it a hobbit hole, but a hobbit hole would be nice, and it's it's not that nice. Uh, anyway, uh, not to complain too much, but my living situation is really not that bad. Um, but so next on the docket for the Romans is Italy, of course. It big deal, Italy. That's that's where where Rome got started, uh, and so the pretext for that comes with a scandal involving several members of the Gothic ruling class. Now, Italy was ruled by Goths, but many of them had taken on customs of the Romans, for example, uh, learning Latin and reading and studying Latin literature. This was exhibited by a Gothic princess named Amalasunta. Uh, she was the youngest daughter of Theodoric, who uh, was the founder of the Ostrogothic kingdom. You'll remember uh, Theodoric, if you go back to our Fall of Rome episode, he's the one who deposed uh, Odeker and Odeker kind of had his own kingdom going on in, in Italy, but it's Theodoric who kicks him out and establishes this Ostrogothic kingdom there in Italy, which is around while they also control some of the, the Dalmatian coast. Um, but so Amalasuntha was married to a guy named Eutheric, who died not long after they were married, but lived long enough to give her two children. Uh, and Eutheric dies before Theodoric dies. So what happens is, when Theodoric does die, the kingship passes to Amalasuntha's son, who was too young, he's like 10 years old or something. And so Amalasuntha basically rules as his regent, but... Uh, her son then dies not long after that. So Amalasuntha becomes the queen of the Ostrogothic kingdom. Now, she makes a big mistake here. And her big mistake is that she promotes her cousin, Fiatahad, to be the, the co-ruler of the Gothic kingdom with her. Now, the issue with this is that Amalasuntha and Fiatahad uh, are pretty different. They, don't, they have some serious disagreements. Now, Amalasuntha... Uh, was very much in favor of maintaining the Roman culture in Italy, learning Latin, learning Greek, uh, keeping up the Roman way of life. And she actually, she seems to have had uh, a close diplomatic relationship, or at least a good diplomatic relationship with Belisarius. And Procopius seems to think that she was thinking about or working towards um, turning over Italy back to the Romans, basically giving Italy back to, uh, back to Justinian. And now, on the other hand, Theodahad was on the opposite side of the spectrum. He, he wanted to leave all the old Roman customs behind, didn't want to learn Latin, definitely didn't want to give Italy back to the Romans. I mean, that's his, he's like, this is our kingdom now. Although Theodahad, as I, as I <laughs> kind of teased earlier in this episode, Belisarius takes a lot of gratuitous shots at this guy, like questioning his manhood, calling him a coward, uh, free, I mean, frequently saying that he's unmanly. Uh, so, but, but he, Theodahad is a member of the Gothic military elite. And so he is more on the side of, we'll leave the Roman customs behind, 
keep our Gothic uh, customs and culture and definitely not give Italy back to the Romans. Uh, and so, as I said, this is a bad move by Amalasintha. I mean, just the idea of the, of the move is bad, but then at, in practice, uh, Theodahad is going to have her imprisoned. And then uh, a little later after she's imprisoned, she is murdered apparently in her bathtub sometime in the spring of four, probably 434, maybe 435. It, when, I, when I was looking this up, it said 434 or 435. Um, and as we're gonna see here in a minute, uh, Belisarius's invasion of Sicily happens in the summer of 435. And it seem, I don't know, it seems unlikely that could that they, the Byzantines would have received that information, communicated it to everybody, got the army mobilized and ready to move into Italy. I think maybe you would have had another, had to have a full year to get all that organized, uh, especially with ancient means of communication. But this was Justinian's pretext for the invasion of the Ostrogoth kingdom, because as we said, he had good diplomatic relationships with the Malacintha. Now she's been killed, his allies been killed. Time to go to war. But so Belisarius, <clears throat> again, I apologize for the coughing. Uh, hopefully by next week's episode, um, I'll be, I mean, I'm, I, like I said, I'm feeling good now, guys. Don't, don't, uh, don't think that I'm like on the verge of going to the hospital. I feel fine. Uh, just sound a little more gruff and, and coughing and maybe a couple, couple sniffles here and there. Uh, should be fine in a couple days. But so Belisarius arrives in Sicily in the summer of 535. And most of the island, like I said, as I said earlier, these are Roman people, almost certainly still Latin speaking people. Uh, and they see the Romans coming, they're like, hey, those are our guys. We're, we're not going to fight these guys. We're, we're happy they're here. And so most of the island of Sicily surrenders to Belisarius without, without a fight, except for the city of Palermo, which coincidentally, aside from Messina, is the most important city in Sicily. And if you've ever watched the movie uh, Patton, the older movie, Pat, I don't remember what year it was made, uh, but I, I think I think it's the only one really. Uh, I, I watched that movie a lot growing up with my dad and Patton is is always adamant about how Messina is the most important city in, in Sicily. And I mean, it is because that's that's the, the the city through which you have to go to get into the to the main Italian mainland. Uh, but Palermo here is the one that holds out against the Romans. And it's interesting what, <laughs> very interesting how Belisarius decides to deal with that, this, is that Palermo is a port city. And so he has to have his uh, ships come around to blockade it, right? Because when you're besieging, it doesn't matter if you're besieging from land, because if the port is still open, they can still get resupplied through there. And so what Belisarius does is he has, uh, he has the ships set up a blockade, but then what he notices is if you climb up on the mast of the ships, uh, an archer would be able to shoot down onto the defenders in, in the city of Palermo. And that's exactly what he does. He gets the ships all lined up. He has all of the archers climb up or really get hoisted on up uh, onto the mast of the ships. And they fire down into the city. And this apparently really freaks out the Gothic defenders there. And very soon after this, they capitulate and they surrender to, to Belisarius. And so Sicily is a really, it's, uh, it's very similar to, um, to uh, North Africa. It's a real quick, easy, uh, the people there welcome them. Uh, not not any issue really there at all. Now the next major city that comes up after this in the Gothic campaign is going to be Naples. <coughs> Naples even today still being the most important uh, city in southern Italy. Now Naples contained a fairly significant uh, garrison of Goths and a sturdy defense system thanks to the topography there. Uh, it's a it's a port city, so on one side, as Procopius points out, it's defended by the sea, and then, as well, there's a steep, apparently steep ground leading up to the walls of of the city. So Bel Belisarius blockades the harbor and makes camp outside the city. Now, much of the population of Naples is actually going to be on the side of surrendering. They again, Roman people. They see the Roman army come in. They're like, hey, this is great. Those are our guys. Let's let them in. And actually, a certain guy named Stephanus, or Stephanus, 
or however you want to say it, uh, comes out to talk to Belisarius, essentially saying that most of the people in the city would welcome a return to Roman rule, but the Goths defending the city would hold out. He says the reasoning specifically he gives for this is that the uh, the Goths who are defending the city have left their uh, families behind to come uh, on this on this station of duty, and if they were to abandon the city, it wouldn't just be putting you know their lives and reputations. Uh, at, at risk, but it might also put their families at risk as well. So they're not going to, you know, these, these Gothic defenders are not going to leave the city. And what Stephanus uh, encourages Belisarius to do is he actually says, move on from Naples, uh, move on and take Rome. And if you take Rome, the Naples is going to fall, like the whole thing is going to blow over and you're not going to have to waste your time uh, sieging this place. However, Belisarius does not listen and he continues on with the siege. But he does make a promise to Stephanus, though, that if he could get the Neapolitan population to re revolt and rise up against their Gothic masters, there would be a, a big reward for Stephanus. And he does try to do it, but the, he can't rally enough support for it because there are, there are some people in Naples who are not totally on board with the idea of, uh, of overthrowing their Gothic overlords. Now the siege of Naples is actually quite hard. Naples is a real tough nut to crack. Um, Belisarius at one point actually fears that he's, uh, that it's just going to end up as a, as, like it's not going to happen. Let me find here. Uh, the parts that I want to read for you guys. Okay. So this is, uh, let's see, uh, book five, chapter nine. Uh, we're starting here in verse 43. Uh, he, Belisarius, made many attempts upon the circuit wall. That's like the, I guess, the outer wall, the main wall of the city, but was always repulsed, losing many of his soldiers, especially those who had some claim to valor. For the walls of Naples was... In, for, sorry, for the wall of Naples was inaccessible on one side because of the sea and on the other because of the difficult terrain. So those who planned to attack it could gain entrance at no point, both due to its general situation and because the ground sloped steeply. So here we see that uh, Belisarius, it actually, it says here later on, uh, Belisarius was growing irritated uh, and he's worried that uh, the siege is not going to happen fast enough, that the siege might fail, and this is going to mess up his plans uh, for as he moves further along in Italy. But the Romans are going to come across some good fortune. Now, one of the things that Belisarius does in sieging Naples is he's going to uh, cut the aqueduct. So there's an aqueduct that leads into Naples, and Belisarius is going to break it at one point to cut the water supply into the city. Now, this actually, Procopia says, it doesn't, uh, change a whole lot in terms of the supply situation in Naples because there's wells within the city and the, the city still has enough water supply to get by and doesn't hurt them too bad. However, we're going to see here that there's another thing that comes up with the aqueduct. This is really interesting. Uh, I think this is a, I think this is really cool. Um, so this, this thing we're about to talk about with the aqueduct and how it's going to lead to the, the Romans taking Naples. But so, one of the Isurians, and you'll remember the Isurians are people from South Central uh, Anatolia uh, who were start, uh, uh, previously used, I believe it was Leo, Emperor Leo, who started using them as a replacement for Ostrogothic federatis, um, more loyal uh, Byzantine uh, uh, soldiers. <clears throat> but uh, still, being, still being used in the army at this point in time. So one of the Isaurians desired to see the construction of the aqueduct and to discover in what manner it provided a supply of water to the city. So he entered it far from the city where Belisarius had broken it open and walked along it with no difficulty for the water had stopped running as the aqueduct had been cut. But when he came near the circuit wall, he found a large rock not placed there by the hand of man, but part of the natural formation of the place. 
those who had built the aqueduct many years before, after they had attached the masonry to this rock, had made a tunnel from that point on, not sufficiently large, however, for a man to pass through, but large enough for the water to pass. And, and so basically, the, uh, this Isurian soldier has realized that this is a way to uh, get into the city is through the aqueduct. Uh, but the, there's this issue here with this rock that's in the a BFR, if you will, big frickin' rock. When the Isurian understood it, this, it seemed to him that it would be possible for the army to enter into the city if they had made the tunnel at that point a little wider. But he was a nobody and had never spoken with any of the commanders. So he brought the matter before uh, Pacorus, an Isurian, a distinguished guardsman of Belisarius. Pacorus, Pacorus immediately reported the whole matter to the general. Belisarius, pleased with the report, took heart and, by promising the, to reward the man with great sums of money, induced him to make the attempt, the attempt to, to tunnel through the rock. He commanded him to take along some Isurians and to cut a passage in the rock as quickly as possible, taking care to give no sign to anyone of what they were doing. Pacorus then selected some Isurians who were thoroughly suitable for the work and secretly got inside the aqueduct with them. Coming to the place where the rock constricted the passage, they began their work not, cut, not cutting the rock with picks or mat, uh, mattocks, so as not to reveal to the army what they were doing by their blows, but scraping it persistently with sharp instruments of iron. In a short amount of time, the work was done so that a man wearing armor and carrying a shield was able to go to that point. And I apologize, I didn't uh, give you guys this. That was book five, chapter nine, verse 11, where it started and that went all the way down to verse 21. So you can see there the, uh, <clears throat> This, this uh, Isurian guy, very uh, uh, industrious, I guess you could say, uh, uh, go, walks along the aqueduct, finds a weak point in the city, says, hey, you know, if we just tunnel through this little bit, I think we can, we can get some guys through there, and that's what's going to happen. So they, make the, they, they tunnel through the rock enough so that, oops, sorry, move the camera, uh, to the point where a man, a fully armed man can walk through the tunnel, and so then Belisarius at night, once the tunnel is uh, completed, uh, sends about 400 men to enter the city uh, through the tunnel. And although there are a couple of, uh, there's a couple of issues with the plan, like the, you know, they don't know the layout of the city. So they're, they're kind of a little confused as to where they are when they get into the city. But ultimately, you know, th these are kind of a, extra details that I don't really think are completely pertinent to the story. They managed to get through, compromise the city defenses, open the gates, the, the Byzantine army comes through and Naples falls. And so then the next city on Belisarius' warpath is going to be Rome, which we will begin to talk about in the next lecture. It's interesting, the lighting has completely, I, I, when I started recording, uh, the sun was setting and a bunch of light was coming in through the window and I thought, oh, I don't need to turn that lamp on and now the sun is set and, and the lighting is, is very different. Uh, but anyway, that, that brings us to the end of this lecture. I, I say this with all of them, but I really do enjoy talking about this stuff. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy listening and watching. Uh, in terms of the schedule coming up here, uh, I know I did not do two midweek videos this time. I'll do at least one mid midweek video. Probably will not have a second midweek video this week because I will be traveling uh, this coming Thursday. I'll be going home for Easter. <clears throat> Though I should be able to post another lecture uh, for next weekend on Saturday, uh, but it may not be a video episode because uh, I don't know, yeah, I will not be here, right? I'll be, I'll, I'll be with my family. And so I don't know like what the background is going. I don't know like what room I'd be able to record in or if, uh, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. So it may just be an audio. Uh, I may, I may not have the camera on for that one, uh, but I do, I will be planning on putting one up. Uh, and then the following week, 
for the following week, they may all be audio because I'll be, I'll be home. My, my school, the school where I work has spring break. So I'll be off for the whole week after Easter. And then I'll be back out here um, the weekend after Easter. So weekend after Easter, we'll be back to the normal video uh, lectures. Like I said, let me know if you guys uh, want me to bring the PowerPoints back and the visual aids. If, uh, if that was something you liked, let me know and I'll, I'll start putting those in again. And I'll just have to write on my hand, like print lecture notes. Uh, but if you've made it this far in the video, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new. Uh, if you follow, oh, ring the notification bell so you never miss another uh, video and we can defeat the evil YouTube algorithm, yay. Uh, also be sure if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Google Play to give us a follow. And especially if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, give us a five star review. Check us out also on Instagram and Facebook at Professor Ren, where I post updates about the show. And that is all I have for you guys today. And I'll see y'all next time.